Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This this is the 29th day of December in the year of our Lord, 2023. And I'd like to talk about, well, <clears throat> authority, tradition, and sectarianism, division in the body of Jesus Christ. So let's start with some scriptures right away before everybody gets a chance to click off. And let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. Schisms, divisions. The word is actually schisma. But that you... Per, uh, be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. Of course not. So you had the beginnings of denominations. I'm of this name. I'm of that name. I'm of this name. I'm of Christ. Yes. <clears throat> Already. In Corinth. Corinth had lots of problems. Um, we have more today, apparently. So what did he say? I plead with you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that you all say the same thing. All agree. All agree. Let's go to another scripture. Ephesians chapter 4. Again, Paul writing here, speaking to the church in Ephesus. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with, uh, with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you are all called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one, in God, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. Talking about the unity of the church. There is only one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, one Spirit. One, 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 one. Why can't we understand that? Because we're all self-centered. That's why we can't understand that. We love our traditions. We love our names more than we love Jesus Christ. They're idols, aren't they? Jesus Christ is speaking in Mark chapter 7, verse 5 here. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So do we. So do we teach as doctrines the commandments of men, and divide the church of Jesus Christ for the sake of our traditions. A contemporary example with me is this. Okay, so there's this Lutheran church in town here, conservative. I agree with them in many, many, many ways. I find their uh, liturgical worship uh, uh, very good, very good. Not what I'm used to. I've been a long time. Uh, in fact, it's even different than what I grew up with. I grew up as a Lutheran. A different kind of Lutheran, a little bit, but nevertheless. 
Uh, the amount of scripture that's read as part of the liturgy is outstanding. The pastor chooses the hymns. It's outstanding. There is no nonsense in the worship. It's outstanding. Just a little bit of stagecraft, a little bit of uh, other things that are like, eh. But in many things, I approve of. Nevertheless, I can't truly worship there because I can't come to the Lord's table. I'd have to have special classes and instructions. Even though I was raised as a Lutheran, memorized the, uh, the small catechism, was confirmed in a church they were at, in fellowship with at the time, the denomination they had uh, an altar fellowship with at that, peri at that period of time. But yet, even though the pastor knows very well I'm a Christian, and I recognize him as a Christian, yet I can't come to the Lord's table. It's not really the Lord's table, is it? It's their table. The table that is restricted to those who hold to their book of traditions. I would have to say I agree with this book. Well, I agree with a lot of it, not all of it. It's like I did a video looking at uh, Luther's understanding of the small catechism, which is really the central teaching of the Ten Commandments. I just think Luther was wrong. He, he uh, should have kept his mouth shut and just put the Ten Commandments there. They were sufficient. His explanations of them muddied them, took the edge off the sharp two-edged sword of God's Word instead of just delivering them as God had spoken them. He had to insert his opinions and require everybody to memorize his opinions and agree with his opinions. Sorry, Luther. So you divide the body of Christ based on your own tradition. That's what the Lutherans do. They divide from one another based on there. The Wisconsin Synod of the, Ameri of the Lutheran Church in the United States, which is a very conservative body, does not have fellowship with the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, which is a very conservative Lutheran Church in the United States of America denomination. They, over some petty deals, they don't allow each other, they, they can't have a Missouri Synod Lutheran cannot go to a Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Church and partake, partake of the Lord's Supper there. Apparently, Jesus Christ himself is not welcome. Do you understand that? When you do not allow other true Christians to come to the Lord's table, you are not allowing Jesus Christ himself to come to the Lord's table. Have you ever thought about that? As you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. As long as we're on tradition. Sources of... Focus, please focus. Ooh, see if I can get there, there, get a little better. Sources, the sources of Catholic dogma. Now, dogma is required, so it is de fide. In other words, things a Catholic must uh, believe or be damned. What did Jesus say you must believe in him, trust in him? That's what you must believe, according to him. He that believes in me has eternal life. He that believes in me shall not perish, but has eternal life. How many times did he say that? Quite a few. Quite a few. And, of course, the, the apostles repeat that. So what do we have to do, according to Jesus? Trust in him. Trust in him. Believe him. So this book here covers a period of time. Let's see, where do they start here? Dogmas of the Catholic Church. So I just opened here to page 38, uh, uh, 89 is the thing. And it's a celibacy of clergy. And where does that go back to? Uh, 
The primacy, okay, this goes back to St. Uh, Syracius or something like that, uh, who was uh, Pope, I guess, I don't know, from 384 to 398, similar to the time of Augustine. Uh, there's a he talks about here about the primacy of the Roman, Roman pontiff, the baptism of heretics, Christian marriage, the celibacy of clergy the ordination of monks, and the virginity of the Blessed Virgin. And then it goes on to the Council of Car uh, Carthage in 397. This isn't all the way back to the beginning. Uh, of course, the farther back you go, the uh, dicier things get <laughs> as far as uh, authentic uh, authenticating them. But uh, So Carthage deals with... Uh, what, the canon of Holy Scripture in the Apocryphal books, the baptism of the Paulinists, um, the minister of confirmation, the minister of extreme unction, the primacy and infallibility of the Roman Pontiff. Well, I would say they're reading something back in here because if I turn to the sources of this, I would not find what they're claiming. I've had enough experience with Christians of various sects to know how they deal with Scripture, not very carefully. So in order to, to verify this example, I, I would have to actually look it up in the, in the church fathers or something like that in context to try to get an idea of what they said. And even then, uh, the only thing we know of is the writings that were preserved by people who had an interest in preserving some writings and not others. <sighs> well, let's give you an example here. So, like, as I mentioned, the Lutheran thing there. Um, a notorious example among Catholics is the doctrine of transubstantiation. Let me look it up in the back and, and see where, where it says there. It says systematic in, index uh, 12... which is in the back here someplace. The sacraments. The real presence. Um, transubstantiation 355 is the first reference. So in the book of Catholic dogma here, which Francis, Pope Francis hates this book. He tells people, don't look in this book. Clandestine marriages. Oh, no, wrong 355. That, that's page. It's, th it's 355 paragraph. So St. Gregory, uh, 1073 to, uh, this is Pope Gregory, 1073 to 1085. And uh, Roman Council uh, 6, uh, 1079. So it says here, uh, it, it is a oath, basically, oath taken by uh, Baron Garius. And the oath he was required to say is, uh, is as I, Baron Garius, in my heart believe and with my lips confess that through the mystery of the sacred prayer and words of our Redeemer, the bread and wine are uh, that which are placed on the altar are substantially changed. That is ter terminology from Aristotle, passed on through uh, Augustine probably and others. I don't think we're at the time of Aquinas yet. Changed into the true and proper living flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. So it is the, the uh, really the body, uh, as was described later, the body, blood, soul, and divinity. So it's the, the living uh, flesh and blood. Um, so it's actually, it is actually the substance, the reality of the thing itself, as opposed to its appearance, 
is literally changed into the in, in here into the living body and blood of the soul of Jesus Christ. Yeah, roughly uh, 1079. Before then, it wasn't a dogma. It wasn't a dogma. So this is called the traditions of men. Things that are added to the faith delivered once for all unto the saints. And how many people were burned at the stake for not believing that? Many. Many. See, the Scripture tells us of the faith delivered once for all. Uh, your Bible might say once, the King James says once, but the, the actual meaning there is a, a, a delivery that's been completed. In other words, nothing to be added to it. It is finished. As Christ said on the cross, it is finished. His once-for-all death, his once-for-all atonement. He's not to be re-crucified. And I know Catholics don't actually teach he's re-crucified. Well, some of them don't teach it. Uh, some of them are probably careless. But nevertheless, tradition, I want to say this carefully, tradition is an opinion. So we're, we're talking about tradition. We're talking about the opinions of men. We're not something, talking about something delivered by God because that was the apostolic teaching was delivered once for all in the first century by the apostles. They are the only ones with the authority of the keys. No one else. And they taught nothing about a succession of apostles. The Scripture says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, that the Old Testament prophets that spoke of Christ and what Christ would accomplish. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The foundation has been laid. It was laid in the first century, in the Old Testament, and then finished in the first century. You can't add to that. You build on a foundation. You do not alter the foundation. It was laid. That's when you begin to build. You first you lay the foundation. You don't go back and change the foundation. You can't add to it. It's what it is. And that was delivered in the first century. And completed, as far as written, by John the Apostle, who was the last, the, the, uh, last apostle alive and wrote, uh, you know, the book of Revelation is probably the last uh, book written in the New Testament. So anything written after that, or which is not authored by an apostle or at least a close associate of apostle, is not authoritative. Even that which is not in the, in the New Testament we have, say James. James, the book of James is not written by an apostle. This is not James the apostle that wrote that. It is James the brother of Jesus Christ. Just like Jude or Judas, the brother of Jesus Christ. Those don't have the authority of apostolic works themselves. It's like the, the epistle to the Hebrews. That book is actually grounded in the Old Testament prophets. Probably written by Apollos. The Scripture describes him as a man mighty in the Scriptures, who was accurately preaching Jesus Christ even before he really knew about him. So... But he's not an apostle, but because it's grounded in the Old Testament scriptures, he has that authority. It's part of the foundation laid of the apostles and prophets, Old Testament prophets, speaking of Christ. See, the church is the church of Jesus Christ, not the church of Moses, although Moses spoke of Christ. It's not the law of Moses. It is not, uh, uh, and the Old Testament prophets, of course, provide the background to understand the New Testament. When Jesus or the apostles speak of Moses, if you don't know who Moses is, or of Adam, if you don't know who 
Adam is or was and uh, what happened there in the garden, well, then you can't understand the New Testament very well. There'll be these blank spots. So, uh, but we have the fullness in them. We have the, 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 the apostles delivered everything the church needs. That's why we're to contend for the faith delivered once for all. Why would the scriptures say that? Or uh, the Apostle Paul talks about uh, the scriptures being sufficient uh, that the man of God is fully equipped for every good work. If it's sufficient, you don't need anything else. Why would? And if it's not sufficient, then the first century church was deficient. The second century church was deficient. Say every church prior to when the doctrine of transubstantiation was made a dogma was deficient, weren't they? No, they weren't. That is a tradition of man. And traditions, when you give them authority, become divisive. Let me go back to this, the Book of Concord. Literally, it's the Book of Agreement that the Lutherans responsible for this. Uh, um, this goes from a period of time from Luther to 1580-ish. 1578 or something like that. Numerous confessions, numerous documents, catechisms, other things in here. So this is what uh, Lutherans of that time said. We all agree about this stuff. Problem is, what about everybody that doesn't agree about this stuff? Some of this stuff is not scriptural. It doesn't come from the scripture. It's like Luther's exposition on the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments comes from the scripture, but what Luther's meaning doesn't comes from Luther, a man's opinion, Luther's opinion of how to understand those commandments. I think they're straightforward, and you shouldn't mess with things that are straightforward. They don't need your explanation, Martin. Your explanation made them muddy. They were just fine the way God gave them. The same with the gospel. We don't need anybody to go beyond Scripture. So when you have traditions, as long as the so, so back to this, as long as these are just the opinions of Martin Luther and the traditions of early Lutheranism, fine. It's when you make them authoritative and you say everybody has to believe these, or if you want to worship with us and you want to partake of the Lord's table, you must agree with this formally. Take classes. Like my parents, when they went to the LCMS for a while, they were they were lifelong Lutherans. They were not liberals. They had to take classes, and they were a little bit miffed about that, with good reason. With good reason. Who are, who is this organization? Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, to compel to to say that you have to agree with us on things that aren't biblical. Now, things that are biblical, that's a different thing. The things that the Scripture clearly teaches, not opinions about what the Scripture teaches, but what it clearly teaches, of course we have to agree with it, especially in regards to Christ. Was Christ God? Yes. The Scripture teaches that. Yes. Was he man? Yes. But when you get off into some arcane areas that the Scripture doesn't actually teach about, like trying to def define precisely the nature of God and man in Christ, what the Scripture doesn't talk about that, and require people to believe what they can't find in Scripture— now you can you can say it's a logical thing that's in necessarily inferred, but to make it a requirement, as long as they're not saying something that opposes those, is, is, isn't it sufficient that a person says, "Yes, Jesus Christ is God. Yes, Jesus Christ is man." 
Isn't that enough? If a child can't understand it, it's saying too much. Because you don't have to agree, you don't even have to know about that as long as you trust in him. Holy Spirit will lead, lead you into all truth anyway. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in you that makes you a Christian, not conforming to some creed. There's another thing that's nothing but tradition. There are no creeds in the Bible. The Apostles' Creed didn't come from the Apostles. It's a short summary that started with a baptismal confession. <sighs> Confessing Christ. Because most baptisms, especially in the beginning, were adult baptisms. We don't have any record of, uh, of baptizing infants until about 250. I believe. But you can check that out. You'll find the same thing I did. Unless you try to read it back in. The point is, Christ, the, the Scripture is very clear that we're all to hold to a common thing, common teaching, as far as authoritative Traditions, okay, your, your church came over from, from uh, Germany and you settled in a particular area in Illinois and built a little German community there and that was your church and, and your ancestors were there and your great-great-grandparents, your grandparents, and your parents. So you have this, this set of traditions around that, fine. But if, it, if you exclude other people from worshiping there, you're not the Church of Jesus Christ anymore. You're just a historical museum. You cannot exclude people that belong to Christ. It's sinful. You're excluding Christ himself when you do that. Can you understand that? Jesus Christ himself said that on the ju a judgment of the sheep and the goats. Inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Whether good or bad. So when somebody that belongs to the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, in whom the Spirit of Christ dwells, a born-again Christian, comes and you say, well, yeah, sorry, you can't partake of the Lord's Supper. Or because you weren't baptized in a particular method of applying the water. Or at a particular time. You can't partake. See, believing in Christ is not enough. Being born again is not enough. You're a sect. And a sinful sect. Again, back to Ephesians chapter 4. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, beg you, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness and with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. There was a time when uh, community churches, real community churches existed, small towns, small villages, uh, not enough people for four denominations, would build a community church and endeavor to have a church where all were welcome, all who belonged to Christ. And it's a challenge to keep, uh, to hold to the fundamentals of the faith. Uh, if you're going to allow everybody, and if it's community governed, there's always a danger that it can slip away. But if you decide to go sectarian, you've already fallen away. Christians, we are always called to take up our cross to die to ourselves, to our traditions, 
Traditions themselves don't have to be bad unless you make them authoritative. So the idea of the community church was a community for all the Christians in that area, which is the one thing about a Catholic church, if it's actually done right, is correct. The basic theology is, okay, you've got a church in this neighborhood. That's where all the Christians are supposed to go, to the one church in that community. But when you add traditions and make them authoritative, you're no longer the church of Jesus Christ. You're excluding him. There are many churches that call themselves community churches. There's some here locally. They're not community churches. There's one here that calls itself a community church, and it's just simply a Nazarene that's changed their sign. Still part of the Nazarene denomination. Uh, you have uh, the non-denominational churches like uh, uh, John MacArthur's church out in California, out in L.A., where uh, it's called it's the it's called a Grace Community Church, but it's not a community church. It's not a community church at all. It's a Calvinist church, a Baptist church, a a uh, a church led by a particular elite group uh, with uh, MacArthur at the head. It's not a community church. It doesn't belong to the congregation. They have no say in it. It's just using that label but not that idea. And you're not allowed at the Lord's table. They're open either, I don't believe. <sighs> when are we going to be his church? When I was doing church in the nursing home on Sunday mornings, because there's nobody else doing it, oh, there would be some ministers and priests that come in or, or nuns or whatever, to serve communion to uh, members of their churches. Not very often, but once in a while. Uh, anybody that seemed to know what they were doing, a little difficult in the nursing home sometimes, uh, that desired, I wasn't going to deny them the Lord's Supper. I didn't care what denomination they were. God looks on the heart. I can't see the heart. It's not my responsibility to judge their heart before I give them the Lord's Supper. I mean, unless it's obvious they just think it's a snack. And even then, in a nursing home, it's like, well, God knows what's going on. He's not going to condemn someone uh, for, for uh, something they can't do anything about. It's not intentional. But to, to withhold that by making some standards that were not biblical, again, in light of the circumstances especially, it's like, you know, if, 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 if you've been baptized, I don't care if you're baptized as an infant or baptized as an adult. If you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's sufficient. Every Christian should be baptized. If you're not willing to be, then there's a problem. But we're not saved by water. We're saved by faith in Christ. And when we elevate our doctrines above what the Scripture clearly teaches, and we don't allow room for other people's understanding of what the Scripture teaches even. Because there can be legitimate difference. We come from different backgrounds. Some of us have very little understanding of Scripture. Some of us have studied it for a long time. Some people have studied it their whole lives, and they don't know the hand, one end from the other because they're not saved. They don't have the Spirit of God. And without him, it's foolishness. The scripture is foolishness, just like Christ crucified is foolishness to those who don't belong to him. But to, the, to us who are saved, he's the, he's the wisdom and power of God.
we have to, especially considering the times, we have to start thinking about this and taking the admonitions of the Scripture seriously about maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, allowing room for disagreement, uh, especially on non-essentials. Disagreement about the deity of Christ? No. D a d disagreement about the atonement of Christ? No. Serious issues like that. We've got people out there that disagree about that. We've got people out there that disagree uh, about whether Jesus Christ died for all man, for all humanity. They're marginal, marginal. But when people deny that Jesus is God or that Jesus is fully man, that they're, they're outside the bounds. But there's a lot of things that we have to allow, because the Scripture commands us to allow, to allow uh, the, the, the unity of the body, the unity in Christ, the, the unity to hold to the, uh, the Spirit of God, the unity of the Spirit. That's more important than our petty disagreements, especially when you take preferences and opinions and traditions and rise, uh, cause them to, to raise above the standard of unity. It's absolutely sinful. Absolutely sinful. I think we're all guilty of it. I've been guilty of it. Time to repent. Time to stop. Time to not allow organizations and traditions and the opinions of men to separate those who belong to Christ. We need to just tell them no. No. If you want to do that, well, we'll just meet out in the parking lot and have communion. We don't need you you want to do that. If you belong to Christ, I belong to Christ, where two, more, two or more are gathered together in his name, there he is also. We need to practice what Jesus Christ himself and his apostles commanded us to do and not tolerate those who willfully divide us for the sake of their power, their privilege, and their traditions.